Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'm chatting with Justin Holland from Iguana Technologies. In this video, we talk about the commissioning of the new facility in San Jose, California for the Duracell Power Center. We talk about the company's production goals for 2022. We dive into the microinverter and we even get into the 10 kilowatt product certification. But before we begin, you guys know the drill. Please like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell and let us know what you think in the comments section. Justin, thanks for joining us today. Steve, it's good to be with you again. How are you? Uh, I'm doing uh, fantastic. Um, so uh, where do we begin? Uh, just this week, you guys made uh, an announcement that uh, the, the facility in San Jose is now commissioned. What can you tell us? What does it mean? And the other thing that sort of, I think, caught a lot of our eyes is that you said that Omega has... Um, gone beyond your expectations uh would love a little bit of color on that as well yeah i mean you know when you put these types of strategies together i mean you're trying to build something that we already want to it's you know, a lot of boxes to check one of the most important boxes to check from my perspective was the manufacturing capability we've got scaling demand right now order book is increasing we've got other you know, products coming down the pipeline, we needed to have that ability. But what Omega did, and when I talked about going above and beyond, we've integrated the teams from a development, and more importantly, a supply chain standpoint. We've been knocking off through, and we'll get into this a little bit more as we go along, part issues through our alternative parts program in record time. And, and that's the process that we were looking to do. So supply chain capability, significantly better than anything we've seen over the history of the company. Manufacturing capability, we're already producing and testing and importantly packaging fully manufactured systems out of Omega. That's months ahead of schedule. We took the decision to just say, we need to shut down the Canadian supply chain entirely, get this moved in with the experts and allow them to open up the floodgates. We've been working towards this for a long time. That's what's so exciting now. The last piece of the puzzle that we thought we had was manufacturing capability tied in with the supply chain. If you look over the history of the starts and stops of the company, you'll see big deals with big players, but very little product movement changes into the market. Now we have that partner who's invested with skin in the game, who wants to kick out as many boxes as possible. They're working just as hard as we are to make that happen. We have a 3,000 unit master schedule between now and the end of the calendar year and it's kind of that getting to that last big box that needed to be checked to open the floodgates on uh, on this company so uh it's i hope the, the the you know the market understood what that press release was about it's a big deal to 100 transition your supply chain bring a manufacturing facility up the curve so it's fully commissioned and actually have it producing full turnkey product from January to March. And that's what we were able to get done. So it was a very busy quarter, but it, it has really set us up for uh, opening up the floodgates with what we want to do. So, so you guys were previously doing all the manufacturing uh, out of Alberta effectively. Um, and now you're sort of working with this company that's an internationally known uh, manufacturing company that has skin in the game that um, clearly cares. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, have you guys just like learned a tremendous amount just from watching these guys sort of pr procure a supply chain and just sort of think about like risks and, and contingency plans? Like, like what's, what's the experience been like working with somebody who's basically uh, an A-list manufacturer? So it's not, it, it's not as much as what we've learned as much as it's the growth of the team and the core competency working on solving problems. So for instance, we had you know, roughly 55 items that we had to, to work through last quarter to set up for this manufacturing commission. We integrated the two development teams and we put together what we call the alternative parts program. 
we are now spinning boards in five to six days with new board layouts to test. Typically, if that was handled in-house holistically at Iguana, that's a four to six week process. That's now a four to six day process because we can divide and conquer. They work on the supply chain. We work on the layouts. They work on spinning the board. We test it. We put it into manufacturing within seven days. It's a significant improvement because of the, the bandwidth increase that we now have. From a pure supply chain perspective, we could bring in more supply chain personnel, but you're still procuring for one product. When you get into a contract manufacturing scenario, you're getting integrated into procurement for dozens and dozens of products. And there's a lot of carryover on components in circuit board manufacturing. So it simplifies the supply chain and, and further reduces that risk. So it's not so much what we've learned as it is the expansion of the bandwidth, letting the core competencies focus on what they're good at and speeding up solutions to supply chain risks and issues that, that we're seeing. So it's, it's holistically better, uh, especially in the environment that, <laughs> that we're in today. So can you walk us through what the, what the goals look like uh, going into, um, I guess, the, the, the second half of the year here or um, the, the, the remainder of the year in terms of sort of where you guys are, are at right now in terms of production run rate and, and the run rate that you hope to be at by the end, end of the year? So target uh, unit production is right now at 3,000. Uh, and, and what we're looking to do is, you know, the, the loose targets are, you know, 500, 1,000, 1,500 uh, across the, the core balance of the quarters in the calendar year. That's what we're planning towards. That's the master schedule, uh, if you will. We feel very good of hitting those numbers within the calendar year. Obviously, it's a significant jump for the company to be looking at, you know, anything in the history that we've done relative to putting out uh, 3,000 systems. The demand is there. We've, we've seen a, you know, a 5x increase in the distribution channel partners right now. We see the order book growing. Micros, which, are, you know, you'll likely ask me about in, in a few minutes. Those orders are now coming in already. So we're seeing the market growth, the channel growth, and now we're pairing that up with the manufacturing and supply chain growth. So we will hold that 3,000 unit target. We are procuring for that on the battery side and all of the component side already. Uh, and, and the team feels pretty good that that's exactly where we'll land by the end of the year. Okay, so let's talk about the microinverters. You brought them up. Um, uh, where, what's the response been um, as, as you take your new product out to um, uh, potential um, dis uh, distributors? Uh, and uh, um, do you see that, that there is an opportunity to compete against the end phases and solar edges of the world? It's outstanding. And, you know, we launched this thing just recently. We have hard purchase orders in hand already. We went early and, and ordered uh, a full container just to have product on, on the North American side. It's already in allocation on that container. So now we're looking at beefing up the second, the third, the fourth, et cetera. What we're noticing from the branches is they want to have two or three options for the microinverter through distribution. And, and think of it this way. If the storage system is unavailable from an availability perspective at branch level distribution, they sell everything else. And you can add the storage system in at a later point in time. If you don't have the microinverter, you don't sell the panel, you don't sell the rack, you don't sell the cabling, you don't sell anything. So what we've learned as we've kind of executed the launch of, of the microinverter is it is a critical component at the distribution branch level that will drive growth for the storage system. We had originally put the strategy together saying, we have to have solar offering and storage offering of a defensive position. What we're finding out now is it's likely going to become a near-term driver and then storage will significantly outpace that as storage becomes more of an infrastructure play for the EV movement, which is really starting to, uh, to take shape. So microinverter launch, you know, we're really happy about how that went. We're, we're quite surprised that we've got purchase orders in hand already. 
verbal forecasts are, are you know, really good. Uh, and, and we think it's going to be a real winner for the, uh, for the organization. So why did it take you guys so long to get into microinverters? Like it, like, it seems like, uh, there's the demand for it was, was it just, you needed a bigger brand partner to, to have it make sense? I think the, the focus for the, the company was kind of perfecting the storage system. And, and we wanted to make sure we had that done. The market was leaning towards storage uh, systems on their own, but what we noticed about you know nine ten months ago was that key players were starting to put a, a smaller circle around an integrated offering. So we wanted to have that same integrated offering. So we went down that uh, that path. Um, store obviously the store. If I just look at the pure storage market, it the growth in storage is phenomenal. The risk that we saw was would dis, would the distributors want to deal with a one-stop shop for the solar and the storage, or would they take a solar asset with the best storage asset? We didn't want to take that risk, so we also went down the path of solar plus storage. Okay, got it. Um, something that's been uh, all over the internet, we get asked about quite a bit, uh, uh, and I have to sneak in a question about is what's what's happening with the the, the ten kilowatt product. Get asked about that all the time too, actually. So, <laughs> um, the 10 kilo, let me just give it to you what's gone on with the 10 kilowatt product. We've had this thing in certification longer than any product that we've ever had. And not to go into too much detail on the certification process, but due to COVID rules, we weren't allowed to send our techs in. We've had four complete 10K systems damaged through improper test installations. The certifier relaxed their COVID restrictions uh, about a month ago. We put a tech in there. We screamed through all the required testing in five days. So now we're waiting for that report to come out, which we expect will have the certification report in the next three weeks or so. Uh, so that product will finally be certified. We've got multiple customers kind of lined up at the door waiting for this product. Uh, across different industries, which will be exciting. I can't go into too much detail on that, uh, but there will be some customer changes on that uh, 10K product, but it's it's going to be a big deal. Uh, and finally, coming out of certification in, uh, in the month of June. So in terms of manufacturing capacity for the 10K once it hits market, how's that going to impact the 5K systems currently being built? Is it going to reduce the capacity for that or is it just going to be additional effectively? So that, that's a great question. So one of the things that the, you know, the development team does is they try to maintain consistency across the products. So there's, there's a, about a 90% consistency at the circuit board level or the inverter level through that. So we look at the 3000 as equivalent. So 3000 equivalent 5K units. So if we were to put in 510 K systems, that would be a thousand. Now, we're targeting 3,000 systems. We're trying to increase that through supply chain to get up to 5,000. But the, the master schedule to answer you know, Steve's first question, you know, what do we see at the end of the year? That's the 3,000. We could easily move 5,000. We're starting to procure for that 5,000 number. So we're increasing the capacity. We've got additional testing equipment. And, you know, guys, we've talked about the testing equipment as being the manufacturing constraint. We've got additional testing equipment uh, ordered already. That puts us into an 800 unit per month across a double shift operation on uh, product availability. So we know we can increase through manufacturing capacity. We know we can increase with the scaling demand. We know the orders uh, profile of the 10K with the two customers uh, who are screaming for it. Uh, but right now, it's uh, it, everything is measured in, in equivalent. So when I say 3,000, we assume the equivalent of the uh, uh, of the 10K into 5K equivalents. Since you've announced the commissioning of of the new plant, have you seen any sort of growth from your distribution partners? Yeah, it's a great question, and and we certainly have. Uh, you know, we've talked about our relationship with CED Green Tech for for a long time, and and it's you know they're the the market leader right now, and and you know we're firmly in position with them. But we've now seen you know the number two, the number three, the number four distributors get on board looking for these products. 
what they scream and their messaging is very, very clear. They want to see consistency in supply. They don't want to start backing a product and then running out of supply. This is why commissioning the plant is so important. They know now that we're in a manufacturing environment where they're going to kick out up to 400 units a month. That gives them the uh, confidence that once they start moving product, they're going to have that consistent supply. They'll start backing that product and they can really move a lot of product. So uh, the, the distribution growth was there through the brand. The manufacturing plant commissioning gives them the confidence. We start seeing incremental orders coming in. And we are seeing that from our channel partners now, even outside of CED, which gives us a wider coverage area across the U.S. And again, uh, indicates where, uh, where things are headed. So we, we absolutely are seeing response from the market based on the commissioning of the facility. Okay, so uh, just wrapping it up here, um, uh, for, for shareholders watching this, what should they be watching out over uh, the near term? Any uh, potential milestones, catalysts, metrics they should be watching uh, over the remainder of the year? Yeah, so you want to you want to start focusing or, or, or zeroing in on the leading indicators. You know, one leading indicator was plant commissioning. Got to get the plant up and running, commissioned so that they can actually manufacture full systems. Omega has been in a position to manufacture circuit boards, but not in a position to manufacture full systems. Now they are. So that's one leading indicator. That's the the announcement we just put out. The second leading indicator is you want to see the microinverter movement. Are we shipping microinverters, yes or no? You start to see those microinverters ship, you know then that that's now going through branch level distribution. That's a, that's a key point. The third key point you wanna see is you wanna see the manufacturing output through kind of the, uh, the current month into June, into July. You should see scaling production numbers and we'll, you know, we'll let the market know, look, you know, set a production record, set another production record, so on and so forth. Those are the three key leading indicators that I see because the output of those three indicators is revenue ramp. So if you see the microinverters moving, the plants commission, and the production increases, you know that the revenue ramp has to follow. So those are the three things to, uh, to look for as a shareholder. All right, Justin, thanks so much for joining us. And we look forward to uh, an update as uh, the story continues to unfold. A busy, busy quarter, Steve. We've got the leading indicators now out there. Look forward to catching up with you again on production results and, uh, and outcomes. So I'm sure we'll be uh, chatting very soon. Take care. Perfect. And, and we'll have you back on uh, once you guys uh, launch a takeover bid for Twitter. <laughs> yeah. That one might be a little further in, in the strategic planning, Steve, but under, understand uh, exactly what you mean. Take care. See ya. Thanks, guys. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Please let us know what you think in the comment section, and please like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. All right. Thank you, everybody.